Okay, so uh, there, there have been some small adjustments. So one small adjustment is if you go to Wikipedia, to a wiki of the GitLab, and then go to the Haskell one assignment. Um, okay, so rollback, Let, let's start with the projects. So in the code repository, there is a hello, hello Haskell um, demo project. And this demo project uh, demonstrates uh, how to set up using stack and also how to do basic testing. Uh, and with basic testing, uh, we've demonstrated to use uh, three uh, testing frameworks. So how to use age unit, how to use property testing with quick check and how to use um, HSpec. HSpec is a little bit nicer than the other two. It has a kind of a domain specific language for writing tests. And if you go to HSpec GitHub IO, uh, you will see there is a simple example what you need to import and how you're writing your unit tests and how you're writing your property tests. Uh, and that is quite nice. It's a little bit nicer syntax than um, doing it with the build-in functionality. So here, for example, to create a test case, we have to use this, um, yeah, we have to create some methods and then we have to create a call to test case, do some assertions and do the testing kind of in a functional style. Um, which is fine. I mean, you can you can do that, and then you can organize your your tests into the uh, test lists. And then with the property testing, you um, creating a, a boolean function, so a function which takes some parameter or parameters and does the the assertion like the test, and then that will be run. Uh, using the, the kind of a special boiler boilerplate code here, uh, and it will test. It will kind of in, instantiate the test with multiple x's. So you don't really need to understand all the semantics, um, all the syntax. Like for example, with the do, uh, with the dollar sign, and so on. Uh, you just need to sort of understand like the pattern, and then you can easily write your own tests using HSpec. Um, so what we will do is I, so if you go back to, yeah, let me duplicate this. So if you go back to the wiki, what I've done is I can encourage you in, in Haskell one to use HSpec for testing. Uh, so it has kind of a behavior driven development style library and domain specific language which robs HUnit and quick check for you. And then using it, you can uh, write some simple tests because all those functions in, um, in assignment or not assignment in the task one are very simple. Uh, and you kind of doing it yourself, but you can use the, for example, the built-in function length to check if your length correctly answers the length of the my length. And then you can easily write like the property checks because you can say, okay, my length should be the same as you know the building length, and then you have a nice property. You have some you know um, invariant for your function, which is always the same, always constant. So the property testing is trying to find some invariants for your functions, such that no matter what input it will get, it will always has a certain property. So for example, for length, you know it will always be the same as the building length, uh, and so on. So you can um, play with the properties because for real world functions that you are building yourself, sometimes coming up with the with properties is actually quite hard. Um, sometimes it's fine. Sometimes it's like, yeah, what is sort of invariant in my function? Like what is constant? What, what doesn't change no matter what I put in, right? And those properties sometimes are easy to find, sometimes not. But for those simple functions, they are quite easy to find. So please, um, uh, use the use the H spec for writing some simple tests for your for your Haskell one, and then uh, there is also a nice way of uh, there is a little bit of a boilerplate for doing the 
documentation testing. So you need to include those the, the, this line, and then you have to um, uh, import the doc test. And then what you can do is you can write some nice um, documentation test. We will cover it today as well. So in Haskell one, I kind of encourage you to um, do some testing in addition to just implementing it, all right? And then in Haskell two, uh, we doing some simple IO uh, and then all the tasks, all the functions from Haskell one were pure. Whereas here you have some uh, interactions with the outside world. Um, and in many programming languages, you can mix uh, when you're interacting with outside world and when you're doing business logic. But in Haskell, and we again, we will go over this multiple times in this course, what happens is the interaction with outside world kind of sticks outside of your, of your core pro program. And then your core logic is kind of pure. Uh, so the interactions with outside world is like a thin layer around your core business logic such that you can easily test it, you can easily mock it, you can do certain things with it. And then the interaction with the world is sort of a you know, couple of functions which sit usually in their own module uh, and you kind of keep it out, you know, separate. So try to, try to think about it when you're doing a, a Haskell tool such that you split like, you, of course you can do everything in one single file, uh, but try to keep some of the functions pure and the main, which deals with IO kind of separate. Um, so th those are kind of two suggestions for this. Uh, assignment one has been posted. Um, it, is, uh, it is a little bit tricky. Uh, you can do it with all the, um, all the basic syntax and all the basic language features that we have, uh, but it will still involve a little bit of work. So it's not something you can sit and like do it in a couple of hours and it's done. You will have to sit on it multiple times because you have to do multiple things uh, to get the whole project going. So it is kind of a little bit, uh, um, a, a small, small project. Uh, so you do need to deal with the user interaction. You do need to deal with your domain, how you model the domain itself. And then you need to model the logic for your domain uh, and then you need to glue the, the user interaction with the domain, with the logic. And then you have to do this kind of AI, like the, the move um, predictor or the move um, function that gives you the next move uh, for the program to, to do. So th those are kind of the three things and they're quite distinct and you will probably need to sit on each of them separate, right? So what I recommend is you kind of start early and you kind of keep going. And then if you get stuck, you ask questions and you try to focus on one thing at a time. So don't try to solve the whole thing at once. Just try to focus, okay, I need to model the board. I need to model the marks. I need to do some uh, operation like rotating the board and so on. So try to focus initially on the kind of the core domain, the core logic, and just do functions which, which help you. Don't over-engineer it only do the functions that you will really need to use. Uh, so the functions that you don't need, don't, you know, don't uh, bother until you really need them. Uh, but you do need to show it on the screen. You do need to deal with reading uh, the user input um, and converting it to some internal data structures and so on. So try to kind of um, start simple and then grow it, but you will have to do it in, in multiple settings. So you, you don't, you know, should not expect that you can sit on it, do it, and, and it's over. Like you probably gonna need maybe three or four sessions, uh, longish sessions on it. Uh, so it took me uh, quite a while to, to do it myself. It was the second time I was doing tic-tac-toe <laughs> uh, in Haskell. Uh, this time it was better. Like the first time I was doing it was uh, a bit of a pain. So I, I expect it will be longer for you and a little bit more painful. But um, yeah, uh, let's see how it goes. You can use the, the code from an internet, of course, and you can get inspired how people solve tic-tac-toe in Haskell. It has been quite a popular assignment. Uh, of course, there is a twist to our one that you have to do some things yourself. You will probably not find it online, but 
the organization, the, the split of the domain and how people deal with IO and so on, you can borrow, you can uh, get inspired. But what I've discovered is that most people are either having really shitty implementation or really over-engineered it. So I didn't find the one that I could just take and add the extra bits that I needed to do. I felt that there were some nice properties of the more complex ones, uh, but they were over-engineered. They made it so complex that I like, why would I need all of that? Like I, it's a very simple tic-tac-toe game, like, you know, keep it simple. Uh, but, uh, you know, you don't want to keep it so simple that it becomes unusable. So, you know, you do need certain level of complexity such that it's easy to add features and work with it, but not over-engineered. So it's a little bit tricky. Uh, if, if you find something that you like, use it, but all the extra stuff that is not needed, simplify it, right? So you don't need to use uh, fancy monads. You don't need to use fancy, very um, complex, you know, data structures. Uh, you probably will benefit from using maybe and either. Uh, those two are very useful, use them. But beyond that, and of course I.O. for, for reading and, 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 and writing, but beyond of that, um, don't make your pro program too complex. Uh, just keep it relatively succinct. Uh, and let me know how, you, how you're going. I, I moved the deadlines. So the deadlines now are on the homepage uh, on the top. So I moved the deadline um, for the assignment because we got a little bit delayed with Go and I need you to do to, to spend some time on it, to, to do it like well and, and understand what you're doing. Uh, don't rush it too much. So the, the deadline for assignment one is pushed. Uh, you will, we will go over maybes and, and IO and, and all those things. So you should have all the vocabulary to, to do it well. Um, the deadline for the, for the tasks is the same. Those are relatively simple if you need extra time if you're doing it and you need extra time for task two uh let me know we can we can push the deadline it's not like i uh, i'm not too um orthodox on on deadlines uh, you know it, it's just a, a way for making you work regularly um so that should be fine so let me know how you're doing uh i will post the submission system for task one and two uh, once we finish it with Christopher, it's uh, still a little bit of uh, work in progress. So there is one note. Um, the deadline means that you stop working on it. And then you typically open the access to your repository such that other students will see it. So when that happens, that means other students will see how people solve some things or they can kind of copy or borrow ideas, which we said it's fine before the deadline, but not after. Right, so before the deadline, you can kind of talk with each other, collaborate, and, and in the README file, say with whom you were working on as assignments. Um, but after the deadline, the work stops, and you're not supposed to do anything more. Uh, even if the, assignment, if the submission system is not open yet, you stop, and we track it by Git, right? So if you go to the Git repository, um, and you, you're checking somebody else's code, you kind of go to the history and you check, let's say the deadline was 30th of January and somebody keep committing after, after the deadline, right? So like if the deadline was uh, last uh, 30th of January and uh, uh, somebody committed afterwards, then you take only the, the state of the work from that time, from before the deadline, right? So you either browse it, like you browse the files at the time they were uh, before the deadline, or you pull the project with this commit, uh, which is before the deadline. So you ignore everything that is after the deadline. So it's not illegal to add stuff to your project afterwards. I, you know, I encourage students to work uh, on their projects or the assignments beyond the deadline. It's just that it's not marked. Uh, we only mark stuff up to the deadline. So it's kind of fair for everybody. Uh, but if you want to, like, you know, you have some hanging refactoring, you want to say, ah, oh, that was a little bit ugly, I can do it better, just go, go ahead, do it. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, those are your, your projects. But uh, as for marking, we, we keep the, the kind of a deadline date. I hope that's uh, more or less clear. Okay, so that was sort of a, a long, longish um, logistics for the course and for the assignments. 
All right, so then one more thing for the logistics is, yeah, so you can always ask me questions. So that's, um, that's the same as, as before. So one, one more thing about logistics is we are encouraged to host um, all classes physically uh, on campus and Christopher has started and we can have classes physically. Um, the problem is our class is at 8.30. Uh, so it's still dark <laughs> when, you know, when I would have to go to work and same for you. And I suspect it will not be that popular, but if it is, if like most of you would like to come, uh, we can run those classes physically. What, what that would mean? Um, that would mean that I will run the class physically and record it, and then the recording will be online but I will not interact with the online students. I will not really ask questions from the online participants live because that doesn't work, which means I can only focus on the people who are in the classroom, ask, you know, answer questions and discuss with them, but online people can only view it afterwards as a recording um, such that, you know, you don't lose the, the content, but you cannot interact. So that that's how, it, how it normally works when we have physical classes, but then, you know, most people come for physical classes. These days, like if you want, uh, we can have physical class, but that would mean I need uh, more people to come than not. And also those who not come, they okay with just watching the, the recording. So I, myself, I prefer physical classes, um, but, it's kind of up to you. So we have a draw at the moment. Can you do multiple answers? Can you pick one of those and one of those? I hope I hope you can. Um, yeah, okay. So this week we're gonna run it online. Um, and I mean, for four people, it's a little bit, uh, we have about 25 people in the course. If only four people come, that's a little bit sucky, right? Um, I don't know how to do it. Uh, I will be, maybe I keep asking this. And if this num, uh, I mean, if this number climbs up to around 10, then maybe we can run class physically. Uh, so like, you know, half of the class declares that they come. I mean, if you declare you come and you don't come, that's okay. But uh, at least, you know, 50% is declaring that they will be coming. Uh, then we can run physical uh, class. And it's going to get brighter, you know, week by week. So it's, it's up to you. So I will keep asking this. And let's agree that if this number climbs to to 10, we will, from the following week, we will do physical uh, physical classes, okay? Um, I, I think that sounds uh, relatively okay. As I said, we have about 25 people in the course, 10 is still a little bit less than half, but it would be worthwhile to have a physical class. All right, so that's for this week. Uh, assignment, I already talked about it. So the programming setup. Um, some of you I, I've noticed are using Cabal and some of you might be not using anything in particular. So I thought <clears throat> I'm gonna talk for a few minutes about what I use and uh, what I recommend. So I recommend using Stack. Um, so for example, for today, um, Stack is a command line tool for managing um, dependencies and for creating new projects and managing projects. So if I want a um, new project, I would, I would say stack new lecture three, and then it will generate, um, uh, it doesn't like, yeah, so, Yeah, so it doesn't like number three as uh, after after the hyphen because it it can mean either version number or um, 
or the part of the name. So let's just call it three. So then I have a folder, lecture three, and in the folder, I have the structure for the, for the project. And the structure for the project is, I have a source, source folder with lib.hs, test folder, and the app with main. So that's the, the entry point and your core logic goes into source and you can create modules here. So you can kind of make it into a library and then the app is the sort of the executable. So it's equivalent to command in Golang. Uh, this is equivalent to the command where you have the main entry point and this is equivalent to all your packages and your kind of the modules. Um, and it generates uh, some dependency like a license file, the, the, the skeleton readme file and the changelog and it has the package YAML which is the, the dependencies for, for your project. So once having this, um, this here, then I kind of use an ID. So I'm using here um, ID, uh, IntelliJ. So I will say open a project and I will point uh, projects university prog. Yes, and I have lecture three. So I will open it. It will ask me, is it a stack-based project? Yes, it is a stack-based project. And then I pick the version of stack that I want it to work with and it will start itself up. Um, so all right, so then let's see while it is starting, what else do I use? So I use um, IDE. Uh, you can use Visual Studio Code. You can use uh, Vim. You can use whatever IDE you like. Uh, I tend to use for larger projects, I tend to use IntelliJ or Visual Studio Code. I have both configured for Haskell uh, and for Golang and they work quite well and I'm kind of in the same environment. And then I use Rep REPL. So uh, once you have this, um, sorted. Uh, you can see, so I have the readme file and then you have the, it has to like initially it's a bit slow because uh, it has to index everything, find all the symbols and so on, so, such that it can do some help for you. Um, so, but uh, in main, I'm just calling some function some func and some func is from library and then it basically prints that and the lib exports it, right? So you kind of uh, have your entry point and then you export the functions that you want and you can, you can test it. And there are multiple ways to test this. So what you can do is you can go into command line and say stack run uh, without the pipes. I don't want the pipes and it will compile it and run it. And that's, that's, that's nice. It takes a little bit, of, a little while to, to build the whole thing. You can test it. So you can say, all right, so it prints. So up to this point, it spits out all the building and all the compilation thing such when you run stack run, it just doesn't run it. It kind of uh, spits sometimes some of the building output. And then this final line is what it actually does. Um, you can also say stack test. And then when you do testing, it's, it kind of uh, builds the test version uh, and then runs the tests. So again, up to this point, it is just uh, output for building uh, the project. Here it starts running the test suite and it says, uh, well, you haven't defined any tests, right? So that's fine. And then you can also, um, yeah, so, so running it and testing it, usually that's the, the two mo most common things that you do in command line. And also you can run the REPL, like REPL is the uh, interpreter 
for your project, which uh, imports all your project into the REPL, right? So if I say stack GHCI, uh, it will run a REPL for me. And then uh, I have exported function like some func, for example, and I can run it. And of course it will have main uh, available as well. So once it loads, it says, okay, I exported for you main and lib, and now you have all the exported functions visible to you and you can run them. So I can run main and it prints whatever it, it, it was printing. Uh, so we can go and change it to, so I can say hello world. Hello world. Uh, and then to have it reloaded, I have to say reload. It just quickly rebuilds what changed. So it only rebuilds lib.hs because that's the only file changed. And now if I call, I can use arrows to recall the function. So if I call main, it says hello world. And then I can also call some func, right? Because it's uh, exported. So I can, I can call that and it prints hello world as well. So REPL is quite nice for testing some of your functions and for checking that everything is, is working. So let's, um, Quit. Let's quit that for a moment. Let's go back to testing and let's go to the test harness. So if we go to spec.hs under test, you will see that the only thing you have is print line saying, well, you know, you haven't declared any tests. So let's fix that first. So I will go back to the commits for the project and I will just copy and paste the boilerplate for doing comment, comment tests and for doing H uh, spec tests. So in tests, I have this. Uh, this one is too big because it demonstrates uh, some of some tests and also demonstrates the H unit and, and so on. And um, the H spec is only here. Uh, but what I really need is I need doc tests. So I kind of copy that, those, those lines. Okay, so we do do. And don't ask me about this. And it doesn't know what doc test is. So as any good um, IDE, it will highlight stuff for you. Um, and then we don't have any property tests yet. So we are not gonna run HSpec, uh, but once we write some tests, we can do that. Uh, what we will do is we will import this one Um, actually, let me just copy that up there. Yeah, let's copy the whole thing and I delete what I don't need. So I don't need the comments here. I would like the doc test. I don't need a unit. Um, and then we are not gonna use any of the H spec yet but maybe we kind of leave it, we can use it later. Uh, all right, so now it con uh, complains that it doesn't know where to import those things from, right? Uh, so we have to go to the package YAML and in the package YAML, we have to add um, the dependency because now we're gonna be dependent on two external libraries, uh, doc test and hspec, right? So we, we go here, and we say in under the tests, uh, we're gonna add two dependencies. So one is doc test um, and one is hspec. And hspec, I don't remember if you spell it with capital H or with small h. So I have to go to Google and I have to search for hspec. And then um, there is a package and it is called, so dependencies, and it has dependencies on hspec discover, on the base, 
and the package is called H spec with capital H, but it seems um, the actual dependencies with the small h. So we should be fine. So once I do that, it says, okay, do you want to restart, restart everything and recheck everything? So I say, yes. Now it's gonna pull those two dependencies. So it is kind of the same as with the Go modules. Uh, it will find them on online, uh, pull them local to your hard drive. I, you probably already have them because uh, the uh, Haskell package repository is usually um, including some default packages and chances are you might already have them kind of locally. Um, you ignore that and we go back here and the you know squirrels kind of uh, disappeared. So it, it looks fine. This one says, oh, I don't like the spelling of the, of the word. So sometimes you get those green ones and yeah, like here and here, but it's just about the, um, the English spelling of words. So now we have everything sorted. So if I go and do test again, um, I should be able to see that, um, not the message that we don't have any tests, but another message that we don't have any tests because again, we haven't written any tests yet, but at least we can confirm that our setup is working and we have everything, um, everything sorted. Yeah, so for the stack, uh, there is a question uh, in, the, in the Zoom chat, how, how you install stack. Uh, there is um, in the, let's see, if we go to resources about Haskell, uh, you do have uh, a, a, a point about installing uh, Haskell stack. So I'll uh, just follow the instructions. Uh, and then when you are setting up IntelliJ, uh, I had to do this for Visual Studio Code and for IntelliJ to work nicely. So once you have Stack installed, you install those two dependencies. Um, all right, so that takes a bit more time than I envisioned. <laughs> I forgot how, how long it takes. So it, it actually pulls all the dependencies the H spec is dependent on and kind of is doing its magic, right? So while it is doing that, Let's go back to our, uh, where are the slides here? All right, we actually ended up with a problem. So let's check quickly. Um, so quick check, yes. So now we see that we are, we said we're gonna import quick check, but we didn't put quick check into the dependencies. So we have to add uh, one more dependency, uh, which is quick check. And I will just assume, uh, let me see the spec. So quick here, quick check was not complaining because H spec pulls quick check, uh, but we specifically say um, quick check is imported and it says, well, it is sort of imported, but it's a hidden package like, you know, the HSpec doesn't export it, so you have to make it explicit. So if I do it again, then it should work. Uh, yeah, so again, we have to do the quick check check. Uh, how you, <laughs> what is the spelling for this? Quick check. So we have, uh, for example, quick check like this. And it says quick check with capital Q and small c. So fair enough. We go to package and we modify it again to quick check. I could just go to my previous uh, template project and copy that. Um, you can do that, like you can just copy and paste it instead of fiddling with those things. But I just wanted to, to show you where do you find it if you do need to find it. So now if we do this, then it should work. All right, so what else do we need? 
Um, so we have the stack installed, we have ID installed, we have REPL working, we have Hoogle. So we search for stuff online uh, with the documentation. Um, so we have it open as well. And then the last thing is usually you take a pen and paper and you take some notes. So when you programming, I often have two or three pens for different colors and kind of a small notebook. So you, you know, take notes, write down some ideas, uh, write down some pointers and things like this. It's very handy. Um, I've seen many people doing that and I've actually learned that trick from, from a friend. So I've seen him always programming with a pen and paper and it's great. So no errors, you know, it says it tried zero tests and we have zero errors, no surprises there, but at least we have the test suite sort of ready. Okay, so we pretty much done uh, with the prep. It took us, I don't know, 10 minutes or so, uh, but we have everything sorted and we have a nice project set up. Uh, we can close that now. Uh, we're not planning to use any additional dependencies. We can add some tests, some property tests here uh, if our project grows. Uh, and then we can write um, we can uh, write stuff here. So for example, uh, what I can do is I can write a Google comment. Uh, so this function returns hello world, okay? And then I will change it such that it doesn't uh, return IO action, it just returns a string. So this function returns a string and instead of saying print this string, I just return the string, okay? So that is a you know trivial, tri trivial change and I add a test for it. So to write the test, you just, um, call the function uh, with those uh, triple um, bigger than signs. And then in the next line, you say what you expect the REPL would show if you call this function, right? Uh, so I would expect a REPL uh, would show hello world. Uh, and that's all about testing this function because it's so trivial. Uh, if we go to main, now we cannot just call this function because we have to do some IO action with it. So for example, we can print it, right? So we can print that, that string. Um, it kind of doesn't like that. It will, uh, yeah, so print, yeah, that should, that should work fine. So um, it will convert this to string and uh, because it's already a string and then Output it to the um, um, to, to the console. So now, if I run the tests again, uh, it's gonna build the, the whole thing. But th this time, it's faster because all the dependencies have been pre-built. So what it should do, it should find that I have one test and the test passed. But actually, it failed. Right? It failed because. Uh, what we say is that we expect hello world as uh, as tokens, uh, as kind of a literals, but it says, no, no, I got a string out, right? So we have to modify, we wrote the test wrong because the, what the function returns is a string, hello world. Okay, so now we have one test, we have, um, uh, one check, so, we run it again and it will pass. And then you see that you have one, uh, you have one example, those documentation code tests are called examples because you, you know, showcasing how the function is used and what it prints. Uh, so we have one example, we tried one, we have no errors, everything is fine. All right, so we good. Let's move on. So, uh, one of my students who was taking the uh, functional programming course in Trondheim and they were using uh, OZ, which is another functional, it's kind of a multi-paradigm programming language. Um, he, he said it's very academic. There is no ID support, the, everything you're doing kind of a notepad, you have to do all the compilation and command line. It's kind of a very tedious and not that professional. 
Uh, and I, I feel Haskell is not like that. I feel Haskell has all the features of the modern programming languages. It has this dependency tracker. You have a lot of uh, packages in the uh, in the uh, hackage, like in the Hoogle, you can find a lot of nice dependencies. You can find a, a lot of functionality uh, developed by others. Uh, you have a very, you know, robust testing framework uh, and so on. So, and you have kind of a very good ID support. Um, so I, I think that's not actually true uh, in general. So, and, and he, he is discouraged for using functional programming because of that, of the experience he had with us. So I'm, hope, I, I'm hoping that you, you guys will not have the, the same experience with, with Haskell because it has all the linter and all the testing framework and all the support that we just talked about comparing it to Golang, right? So Golang and Haskell and Rust uh, in terms of the tool, sub tooling and support and testing and all that, I don't see much of a difference between them. They have some small quirks. They, they differ a little bit, but in general, they are like miles ahead of say C++, right? Uh, none of that exists in C++. And C++, when you have to do C++ development, it feels kind of ancient. Like it feels so many things you have to do by hand. Uh, whereas with those tools, a lot of things are kind of automated. Uh, and a lot of things, are kind of taken care of by all the tooling that you already have. I, I mean, C++ is getting there, but it's not gonna get there for another couple of years until they really sort out the modules uh, concept. Uh, it's probably coming in C++ 20, uh, but until the modules are sort of sorted and you can easily do dependencies and things like that automatically, of course you can do it sort of by, by hand at the moment, uh, then it will still feel a little bit, um, hard. Yeah, anyway, um, let's go on and let's do some coding. So uh, basic syntax of um, of Haskell. So I'm, I'm, I don't know how, how much of the book you've read, but you should be familiar with the if expressions, function patterns, uh, function guards, let in, case, function composition, carrying, and you know, putting things in brackets and the dollar sign. Um, putting things in brackets and the dollar, dollar, dollar sign might be causing you some headaches because um, it's a little bit different to the Golang or other programming languages. And then knowing um, what is the parameter and what is the next kind of a call to a function is a little bit counterintuitive. So typically what you will do is you will put more brackets that you need uh, and then the ID will tell you, you don't need the brackets here. You can sort of uh, skip them. Uh, we will do a little bit more complex things in a moment, but let me just do uh, simple uh, things with um, function patterns and function guards. So let's, uh, let's use a simple um, example. So um, you often find online kind of a programming kata. So those are a, a small tasks in, in programming that you do like every day <laughs> to kind of keep your skills up to, to speed, right? It comes from martial arts and it's kind of an idea that to get yourself kind of um, accustomed to certain patterns, you kind of practice them. Uh, so I can kind of uh, use a couple of uh, very simple um, tasks here, uh, such that we can demonstrate all those, all those features that you should already be familiar with. So if I, if I have a list of three numbers, how can we show them as a comma separated row of numbers, right? So let me just write it here. So, uh, let's say I have uh, this function, or let's say converts converts a list of numbers into a string row with numbers being comma separated. And then if I write a test for it, so 
if I call my function um, row, uh, let's say int to string, and it takes it takes an array of ints and returns a string, then if I call it int to string and I give it one, two, three. What I expect to get is a string of one comma space two comma space three, right? Uh, that what I would expect to get. Do we need more tests? Yes. So usually when you're doing tests, you try to think of border cases. So what will happen if I give it an infinite uh, list of numbers? Well, do you want it to be printing forever or not? That's one kind of edge case. What if you give it uh, an empty list? Well, maybe we want empty string, right? So if I give it uh, int to string an empty string, uh, empty list, then I want empty string back. Okay, uh, with the infinite one, I'm not gonna deal here with, uh, but let's use those two as kind of a border cases. Uh, what do we what do we want if we get just one number? Well, okay, uh, with one number, um, so int to string with just one number, uh, what should we get? Should we get one or one comma? Uh, one is fine. Uh, we can constrain the problem. So actually, let me see. Yeah, so the problem is constrained just to three numbers. So I can demonstrate some of the pattern matching in, in Haskell, such that we don't need to deal with generic case. Uh, and a lot of times, uh, as, and also when you're doing the assignment uh, in Haskell, the difference between something being fixed and something being kind of a variable length is not that much work. So it's it's usually, it take, takes a little bit more time to think about it, but it will then be a robust solution for a uh, very flexible uh, um, data structure. So here, if we say, instead of calling it int to string, uh, let's call it int three because we will only deal with up to three numbers, right? So we will say, um, I have, if I give it three numbers, I get this. If I get give it an empty, um, empty array, I'm gonna get an empty string. What if I just give it one number instead of three? Well, then it's an error. I'm gonna get an empty string as well, right? So we kind of change the, the semantics of what we want to do based on the, uh, of the task. So given a list of three numbers, show them as a comma separated thing, right? Okay, so we can only have three numbers. So how are we gonna do that? So then you have this functional pattern matching. So uh, normally if you have this case, those cases in Go, for example, you would use if statement. So you'd say, okay, if, if length of what I got is less than uh, three or more than three, I'm gonna return an empty empty string. But what if it is exactly three, I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna convert it into this kind of a comma separated line, row. So in Haskell, instead of if statements, you use uh, pattern matching on the functional on on the function itself, and you can do it in in different ways. So one way is you say in three string, um, I um, I can pass it uh, an empty an, an empty list, and then I'm gonna get an empty string back. So that's one pattern. Uh, I can pass it um, I can pass it a, a list with a single item, and then I'm gonna get um, I'm gonna get an empty string as well. And now I I want to say I want to pass it two numbers and also get an empty string. So I can say and in three string, and then I have an item X and Y, and that's an empty string as well, right? So if I get int three string, and I have three, exactly three numbers, Z, then 
I'm going to produce them as a, as this kind of a comma separated uh, um, string. So I know X, Y, Z are numbers. So I need to convert them to strings. And you do that by calling show. So show X concatenated with a comma and a space, and then concatenated with show Y, concatenated with comma and a space, and finally show Z, right? Uh, and then I need to deal with a case which is larger than um, three, three elements. So I would say for everything else, if I have string and I don't care what this pattern matches because uh, the pattern matching goes from top to bottom. So if it doesn't match this, it goes to here. If it doesn't match this, it goes to here. If it doesn't match this, it goes to here. And if it doesn't match this, it goes to here. And then I don't care what that pattern is, but it's an error because I have something larger than three, right? So let's, let's test this and let's see if it works. So this is kind of a, a, a brute force uh, check on the, um, so it says we had four examples, we tried four and all passed. So all our tests, all those three tests plus this one, <laughs> they passed, which means our implementation does what we want it to do, right? Uh, but it's a little bit verbose and it, it's a little bit ugly. So we could do better than that. Uh, so for example, what we can do is we can say, well, um, let's change it such that we take the list of numbers and we use guards. So when you're using guards, you're doing this bar and you're, you're doing some Boolean constraints on what you want to check. So for example, I can check the length of the list and I can say if length of the list is less than three and length, length of the list is more than three, which is basically asking if it is three, right? So let's rewrite it. So if we say, if the length of the list is exactly three, uh, I need to do this. And then for all the other cases, um, and then I need a Boolean expression which says true effectively, and there is an acronym for that, which is called otherwise, um, I just return an empty string, right? So I converted those kind of uh, ugly looking, more verbose um, uh, calls to this one, but with this one, I have a little bit of a problem because um, I don't want to show XS I want to show the head of XS, right? So I need to show the head of XS. Uh, and then for the second one, I have to show the head of the head. And then I need to show the final element, which is the head of the head of the head. And now you get into this uh, business of brackets or dollar signs, because this function expects one argument but it looks like you're passing two arguments or three arguments to that function, right? So it says, well, you're kind of uh, uh, passing too many things to, to it. So you need to either do brackets or do dollar signs. Uh, so let's do brackets. Let's see if that will fix it. Okay, so the head also expects a single thing. So and then it's x s all right so then the line gets a little bit long so what we can do is we can split it into the sections and do this all right so that will work um z s yeah so what i have uh x s and access. So, um, yeah, so not head, but drop one. And then head of drop two. 
right? So what we're doing is we kind of extracting the, the first element from XS using the head, and then we dropping it and getting a head from what's left and dropping it and getting a head from what's left. Um, but yeah, that is kind of ugly. And then the ID already tells you, yeah, that looks a little bit ugly. First of all, you don't need some of the parentheses. Uh, second of all, uh, the first call to head is kind of okay. But if we want the first element of the list, there is a nicer syntax to get that. So what we can do is we can say, I want the first element of XS, right? So I want the first element and I want the second element. So the zeroth element, like for consistency, I could have uh, used the same notation to get the zeroth element, but head feels a bit more functional, whatever, like whatever your style is, you can kind of rewrite it to be a little bit more succinct. But this will work also. So let's let's run the tests and check if it compiles, if it runs the tests. Um, yes, success. We have all the test cases working, same as before. The functionality is a little bit nicer. Ah, uh, yes, there is this kind of um, before we've used the pattern match. Uh, we cannot really use the pattern match because we want to deal here with the case of an empty list as well, right? Uh, and then this, this will catch it. Uh, so this is using the guards. The previous one was using the, um, let's, let's go back one slide. Yeah, so we had the function pattern. So we expressed the function as a function pattern before. Now we, we don't have a function pattern because we just catch everything in a single declaration here, uh, but we're using um, guards, right? So we can, um, the, the function guards. Uh, we can rewrite it with if statements inside the body, but that would look kind of much more ugly than, than using the guards, such that uh, we would have to have this sort of um, nested expressions. Every time you start doing kind of a nested expressions in Haskell or nested case statements in Haskell, you're probably doing something wrong. There is probably an easier way to achieve that. Uh, all right, so what else is left? Uh, let in and, um, and case. So let's do... Let's move on and let's see what is the next uh, next uh, thing. So in the next example, we should swap elements one and three of our, uh, of our three element array. So we assume that we have a three element list and we want to swap one with three. Uh, so let's call it swap. And what it will take? Well, it will take an array of ints and it will return uh, an array, array of ints such that swaps uh, element zeroth with element two second. Okay. Um, so let's write some tests before we implement it. So if I say swap uh, empty list, what should I get? Uh, I probably should get an empty list. If I, that's a border case, which is an error, right? If I swap, swap and I only give it two numbers, what should I get? I probably should get an empty er uh, list as well because again, it's an error. What if I give it three numbers? One, two, three. Uh, what should I get back? I should get three, two, one. And then what if we give it four? Again, we can use it as an error condition. So if I give it one, two, three, and four, I probably should get an empty list because it's an error. So error are kind of represented as an empty list because that's what we get back here, right? 
Um, all right, so let's write it. So now I have to deal with the same casing as before. So I have the same situation as before that for everything that is not three, I have to return an empty list. So we can again use uh, the same pattern. So we will use guards initially. So let's do guards. So if, um, if length of xs is three, then we have our normal condition. So the normal condition will be here. And then uh, here we say, otherwise um, we return an empty list. Here, I would really like to have this pattern matching, which we had before uh, for swapping the first and the last element. I don't really want to be doing this. I mean, we could do this. We could do is like extracting the elements uh, from the list like we're doing with the, um, with the get me the element nth from the list uh, notation, but I'd rather use a pattern matching because it, the code will look nicer. And also if we rewrote this to pattern matching, the code would look nicer as well. So what we can do is we can say, okay, uh, let's use let expression. So let expression allows you to declare some things uh, and do pattern matching in, in, in those declarations. Uh, and then do some output in the in statement, right? So what we can do is we can say, actually, I have, I have a list of three things, which is A, B, C. And this list is actually the same as XS, right? So I'm doing the pattern matching to A, B, C from XS. And then I will say in, uh, and then I need to do what happens what the result of this of that whole statement is right so the after the equals it's um so it's the same as here after the equals we say what the function output is what is the result uh so the same as here but after the equals we have an expression and this expression will be uh evaluated and it will have um the output of what is in the in expression. So this expression will be the output of our of our swap once once it is executed. And it's effectively C B A, right? So we want to swap A and C, uh, leaving B in the same place. Uh, but we cannot do pattern matching at that point because we want to, to calculate the length and we also want to deal with the empty list. And then, you know, pattern matching for an empty list wouldn't match. But in this particular section, in this guard, oops, sorry, in this guard, we know the length is exactly three because we're checking for it such that we can do this pattern matching and we can do the swap. Um, yeah, fair enough. So, you know, if we, if we save it and if we rerun our tests, we should have a few more tests. So before we had four, now we have six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, and we can check if all nine tests pass. We have eight, uh, I counted something wrong, but uh, so let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, correct. All right, so we have eight tests, all those tests pass. Well, the function does what we want it to do. So we have it solved. Great, any questions? So, we experienced the function matching, the guards, and the pattern matching inside let expression. And we, we see that let expression has some kind of declarations, which declares variables and does pattern matching or what we want to achieve. And then the final expression or the final logic is you know, in the in. Um, there is also a where, um, uh, where expression. So if uh, we could rewrite the swap into alternative swap, uh, which would do the same thing. So let, let me do that. So if I do swap um, swap three, um, and again, it's, uh, it's, it has the same signature. So it does the same thing, but this time we're gonna deal with the pattern um, 
So let's say swap three, we have the, um, we have to deal, we ha we basically rewriting this, this, this guard. So the guards have to be the same because we want to deal in a single way with the length that, that is not, not three. Uh, so what I can say, I can say length of XS is not, is not three, then return an empty, um, empty thing otherwise. So I kind of uh, turn around the logic here such that I have the error first and then I have the default condition for the length of three. Um, otherwise, uh, the function equals something. Uh, so I, what I can say is it equals uh, C, B, A, where, and then I declare uh, what, what I meant. Uh, and then we do the pattern matching here. So A, B, C equals XS, right? So a where close is kind of a inverse of let where the, the logic of in comes first and then what all your declarations come second, right? So th those two functions are the same now. The only change I did is I changed the condition, like I swapped the condition such that I have error first instead of error last. Uh, and I have the, the business logic as the default case, the otherwise case. Um, and then I changed the, the matching to be inside a where clause and I changed the, um, the logic to be before the were, were close, right? So if I wrote the tests here, so let's just test it. Alternative swap. And then I can uh, effectively copy those tests for my alternative swap and call it swap three. Okay, save it at empty line here, rerun the tests. Uh, it will kind of, you know, hopefully it will work the same. So you may ask, what's the difference? What's the difference between let in and where? Why Haskell has both? Well, the difference is that where is only usable in the blocks of code. So where you have kind of a function declaration or where you, you know, dealing with functions, you can use where, but let you can use everywhere you use an expression because this is just an expression. Uh, so you can use it everywhere you want. So for example, I could use it here. I could say in, and I could use another let expression inside in, whereas where you, you couldn't use where inside in here because after in here, we expect an expression and where is just a syntactic sugar. It's not an expression. It's just a syntactic sugar for dealing with function declarations and function definitions. Uh, whereas let is a, a full blown expression, same as if, and you can use it everywhere where you would normally use an expression, right? Um, so that's the, that's the difference. It takes a little bit of getting used to like those um, uh, where to use where and where to use let, uh, but a rule of thumb is most of the time when you can use where, use where. And then when you cannot use where, use let. <laughs> so you see uh, this code is actually looks nicer than, than this one, right? First of all, it looks nicer because I'm dealing with the error first uh, and that is a little bit uh, cleaner to, to follow. Like you say, okay, what are the edge conditions? What is the business logic? Uh, here it says, oh yeah, it's like we're doing something and otherwise we do that, but what is an error? Like, is it this an error? Or if this is an error, what is, you know, what, what is the logical flow? Usually we, we check, we do assertions and we do some checks for border uh, cases. And then we have like the body of the, of the normal like business logic. So from that point of view, this one is nicer. And also um, you see this, it says, swap A with C and X and C is just pattern matching, right? Whereas here it says, oh yeah, we do some declarations and this happens. And it's a little bit uh, harder to sort of um, 
walk through it. So in, in terms of style, this one is kind of a better, the swap three is a, a better implementation, right? Okay, so we covered um, most of it. We, we didn't cover like one last thing, which is carrying, but we can cover it. Um, we can cover it a little bit later. So that's, um, yeah, let's, let's do one uh, simple exercise. Um, so let's, let's do this one. Uh, it's kind of a children's uh, game, think of a number. So think of a number, add one to it, square it, subtract one, divide by the number that you first thought of, subtract the number you first thought of from what you have, and the answer is two, right? Magic. So now uh, write this function. So write the function called think that will do this. Okay, so the first, first task for you is what is the type of that function in Haskell? So use your uh, Haskell skills and write the, the um, what would be the, the think type. So again, I will show you what the think is. So think um, is this. How should we, how could we model it? Perfect. So think will take an int and will give us an int back. Um, you could be like that, that's perfect answer, okay? If you a little bit, um, if you want to over engineer it, <laughs> So let's do it. Um, so this is a perfect answer. So think uh, takes an int and gives us an int back. Uh, if you want to be um, super fancy about this, what you could do is, um, so think of a number game. So what you could do is you could say think um, takes an integral type and converts this integral type to the integral type. Because we, like by doing int, we, we say what is the limit of what the initial number can be. Right, so if we say think of a number and somebody thinks about really, really big number, which is larger than the largest int, then our function wouldn't deal with it, right? You, then you would do this, right? Because integral means any integer which is of the various sizes. It's the normal int, the 32-bit int, the 64-bit int, or the arbitrary large int, right? So, but, uh, normally for the job interview, you probably should not do that because they would think, well, you're some sort of a geek. Uh, you're probably too, too smart for us. So in job interviews, do this, right? But you know, you could do this. All right, so then uh, we have to write this function. So I will um, let you see, uh, let you see that. Unfortunately, uh, let me just uh, make a screenshot such that you see the screen. All right, so, and then you can write this function. So write, write the, 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 this function Haskell. While you're doing it, I will just jump in here and I will quickly add a test case for us such that think, so when, when I say think 21, I gonna get two. If I say think 
think 42. I'm gonna get two back. Okay, so our test cases for those, uh, for the numbers are like this. Uh, and of course, this is an invariant. So what we could do is we could write a nice property test for HSpec, which says, no matter what number you pass it to it, it always returns two, right? So um, we could write a, a, a nice test to, uh, to demo that. All right, so let's see how you guys doing with, with writing this. You could, uh, you could do that, although that's not legal Haskell. Uh, so you could cheat and just return two, but that's not the syntax. So if you want to do that, do it, but do it with Haskell syntax. What would that be? That's almost, that's the body of the, of the function, but like you have to write the full, full declaration, full definition. So in, in Haskell, this is the type declaration of the function and this, this is the, um, this is the definition, but as you see, it kind of complains, right? So, so we would have to do this and we would have to say, we don't care what we pass in. Right. Uh, we probably don't need that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it will, because we declare the type, Haskell will coerce this literal, which is polymorphic to int, but we have to do this, that we don't care what we're passing, right? So that, that would work, uh, but that, that would not be fun because what we want, we want to actually do this, right? Yeah, I cannot, can I, yeah, let's see, sounds good. So let's try it. So I have an expression. Uh, why doesn't like the brackets? Yeah. So there is just one problem here. Uh, Haskell has two, uh, two divisions. So one is the fractional division, which is the, the normal division sign. And the other one is the integral division, which is just called diff. And to call it in the infix notation, we have to use the ticks. Um, so that sounds like a, looks like a good answer. So let's test it. Fingers crossed. Yes, it worked. So we have our test passed and this implementation works fine. Um, it is uh, one kind of a one expression uh, which uses the normal infix notation for the operators uh, and then it gets the, uh, the job done. So this is uh, perfectly fine. <clears throat> and that's what you would use in most programming languages, in, including Haskell. Um, sounds good. All right, so the bottom line here is we've done very simple kata, we've done some testing, and we've always used automation, right? We didn't test it any of the function by calling it by hand, right? What I can do is I can do that. I can go to uh, to the repo and I can test it manually by hand. So I can say, okay, um, think 12, 
um, okay, and that it doesn't doesn't work because we didn't export it all our newly created functions. So uh, let me do that. So we have to export think swap swap three and three string whatever right so now uh if i reload this reload, reload i can say think 12 think 42 i can do manual testing uh, swap swap three with some array uh, with some list and so on but that's not what you should do. You should not do this by hand. You should always use automation. Do write those edge cases and some test cases in your comments, in your examples, and be done with it, right? Uh, because first of all, it's less work, uh, less typing. You type it once and you can retest it, you know, multiple times. And second of all, all your tests here, they disappear the moment you finish your REPL session, whereas all the tests that we have in uh, in here, they live forever. And any modification of your code, anything, they will be checked that something is not broken, right? Uh, and if you decide to re-implement uh, re, re something, you can reuse the tests. So if you decided to re-implement the, you know, the swap, we could reuse the tests and yeah, be done with it. So uh, automate, um, that's the big lesson here. Okay, uh, what else? Um, unit testing, yeah. I'm not gonna spend more time on this. Uh, let's do one more kata. Uh, let's see if, if we can do that. So you, we have eight minutes left. You have four minutes to write a program in Golang, which uh, will convert a number like uh, from one to 35 uh to roman string so we want those are examples so if you get three you're gonna get th three in the roman numerals if you give it 17 you're gonna get this and 31 you're gonna get this can you do that can you do um two roman in golang in four minutes Okay, let's let's forget about uh, let's forget about Golang. Let's just do it in pseudocode. How would you do that? So how would you convert an integer into a Roman numeral as a pseudocode? Okay, so I already talked for one minute, so you guys have three minutes left. Give me a pseudocode. And while you're doing that, I will start because we really have not much time. So I will start preparing for it. So to a Roman, it will take an integer and give us a string back. And it converts an int into Roman literal. Okay, and I need some tests for it. So two Roman, one, what it should give me? It should give me one. That's super boring. So let's, oops, let's do the test cases that we had there. So two Roman, 17, that's X five and two bars. Okay, and one more. So, two Roman 34, 33. Okay, let's do it. So it will be 33. Okay, let's do one more. How is it going with the pseudocode? To Roman 37 or 38, B one, two, three, B and three. All right, so we have the tests. We just need to write a stupid body. 
Uh, okay, so there is um, Yeah, that that would work. So if it's bigger than 10, we do that. So up to 35, that that algorithm would work and we could like that is kind of a good implementation of it already. So it would work. It would kind of not work for uh, larger numbers, uh, but for tens, it would work. Um, and also this algorithm would be a little bit hard to because we also have the situation where you have you end up with like uh, for for example for forty, uh, you en end up with four uh, x's. But in fact, what you should do is you should just say uh, one x's and what's the fifty? It's l, some something like this, right? So for uh, for one less, we don't do fours. We do one less than the other one, right? Um, so let me quickly go to the next uh, slide. All right, so that would be the Golang thing. I was planning for you guys to do uh, Golang, but if we follow this pseudocode, so we start with the n copies of, of just i, and then we keep tallying. So we keep replacing the smaller ones with the bigger ones, right? So let's keep that um, let's keep that visible. And what do I need to do is I need to do okay. So two Roman takes a number n and it equals, and we have to do. Um, so uh, replicate, we are gonna do n bars. And then once we have n bars, we're gonna replace four uh, fives with these, right? So we're gonna do replace uh, one. Uh, yeah, let's use I, it will be easier for me to type. I, 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 one, two, three, four, five with, one V and then we have, we need this dollar sign and then replace uh, two Vs with one X and dollar sign and replace. Um, yeah, we, we said up to 35, so we don't really need to do the L thing, but let's just do it for kicks. So I have one, two, three, four, five with uh, a single L, all right? Uh, and then that would work. The only thing is we need the replace function. Um, the replace function is there. Uh, and you know what we want is we want to replace one string with another string. Given a string, it gives us a string, right? So let's go to Hoogle. Um, where is Hugo here? Um, so if I go back to Hugo and I say, I'm looking for a function which takes a string, um, which is the old string, uh, the new string, which it should replace with, and the, the text that I'm kind of replacing, and then it will return me a string. Uh, let's check if such function exists. So I will um, search for it. There might be, you know, many functions which take three strings and produce a final string, right? Uh, but chances are, well, look at that, replaces number one. So it takes the old string, new string, the string for which those two should be swapped and then gives me back the, the, the string. And you see that there is, um, a package called uh, foundation string and another one kind of called string. Um, 
So I can import that and I can use this replace function to have the two Roman going uh, or I can implement the replace myself, right? So I run out of time, it's 10. But if I do that, I will commit the code. So I'm not gonna use the, uh, the building function because I would need to um, uh, I would need to import it and make a dependency on it. And for learning, I, I mean, normally I would, but for learning, what we will do is we're gonna write a small uh, function that does that. So uh, feel free to go if you if you need to go. Uh, that should not take long though. So replace is gonna take a string, which is the old string, new string the text to be replaced and the return. Um, and let's kind of implement it quickly. So I have an old string, I have a new string, I have the text that I'm replacing and it will return me the new, uh, the new text. So I can do that with guards or I can do that with the if statement or you know, whatever you want, uh, depending on your style. I'm gonna use it with, um, I'm gonna use it with the if statement. So if um, the old, yeah, so if we take, take the size of old from text and it equals old, then I want to say that um, the returning value is new concatenated with drop as size from text and replace old with new with that. Else, Else, um, we gonna replace old with new in the head of text uh, tail. So we skipping the first one. We doing that where where size equals length of old. Right, so let's, uh, so old new text, let's put that in and let's run the tests. I should write tests here as well for making sure that the replacement works. Let's test this. Right, so we have a problem with an empty list. Uh, yeah, so of course we have a problem with empty list because I'm recursively calling replace uh, and I need to deal with the case where I am replacing old with new on a text that it's already empty and that returns an empty string, right? So because we uh, we reducing the size of the of the of the matching, if we didn't match on the first one, we shifting by one character, right? So let's do that. Um, so with the, yeah, we uh, replicate. Yeah, so this is, yeah, I do need tests for this. Uh, replace old 
string substring with new in text. All right, so let's write some tests. So replace x with i in x i. And I expect, yeah, so what is the dollar sign? Um, let me go back there. Right, so what happens here is we start by producing n i's as a string, and then this is fed into this call. So the dollar sign is basically saying, uh, call this function with this parameter, this parameter, and the third parameter, which is whatever, is ends up after, you know, from this expression. So this is kind of like uh, saying the same as saying this, but now replace takes three parameters, which is this, this, and result of what this function does. So what we can do is we can do this. We can say, okay, uh, replace this with this in whatever the result of this is. Uh, and then we can skip the brackets. Uh, we can re replace the, the braces with the dollar sign, right? So it basically says, okay, do this first, do this first. And once this is done, use it as a parameter to this. So it's a, the same, like, yeah, effectively the dollar sign replaces us those brackets and the same here. So the dollar sign replaces us those brackets, right? So instead of using brackets, we can use a dollar sign every time the bracket goes all the way to the end, right? So if the brackets goes all the end to the end, we can kind of uh, replace it, replace it with the dollar sign. And then I can um, split it into lines such that it's easier to read by just doing that. Uh, remember that Haskell kind of is a little bit like Python. It, those lines have to be aligned. If they are misaligned, uh, Haskell will get confused. Sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it does. So make, make sure that th those things are aligned. Um, I'm gonna check why I'm... Um, so, replace, so we kind of are calling, yeah, that should work. Yeah, let me just quickly just run the test on this. Any other questions? So this, um, you can kind of expand this algorithm to deal with uh, footer cases and also do this kind of conversion of four things with, with one thing. Um, so, ah, uh, yeah. Okay, so in the case where it doesn't match, I forgot to include the head. So we, we matching on the tail, but we lost the, the first character, right? So what, what I need to, um, to do here is I need to say um, head of text concatenated with the replacement of the rest. Yeah, and because it's a single character, it's like this. And because I don't, the um, this one knows how to do the association, I don't need the brackets. And because this one knows how to do the association, I don't need the brackets neither. So the uh, interface will tell you where you don't need the brackets because the, uh, the system can kind of work out. Um, so now it should work. All right, so um, yeah, it still doesn't work. Uh, I messed up with the bars. It's not a bar, it's an I. Uh, where is I? Oh, come on. Uh, B. I don't know where my I on the keyboard is. Come 
come on, 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 come on. That's here. Perfect. All right. That has to work. All right, so thanks, sorry for going uh, over time. Um, tests, 19 tests, all tests pass. Our implementation of the, of the system works. It should fail if I test. So if I say uh, two Roman and I say number four, uh, so I don't expect, sorry. I don't expect I, 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 I don't expect four eyes. I expect I and five, right? Uh, so this test should fail for the current implementation. Um, I just need to add uh, that replace um, I, 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 I four with, with this, right? So then uh, if we rerun the tests, five will work. Uh, also, what will not work is to Roman like nine. Um, I expect, so I expect this. All right, so we got, uh, so nine. Ah, uh, yeah, because I was typing and it was saving. Stupid thing. Okay, so one more time. I'm not typing. So uh, for nine, it should do give me this, but currently what it will give me is five with four. Uh, four. Um, no, actually, it will give me. It will substitute this. So. Um, yeah, exactly. So it it will say. Um, five plus four is nine, but in fact, I want nine like this, right? So I need to substitute um, uh, nines to, to um, like, I have to turn it around such that I, I have the case for, um, so if I have, So replace if I have um, one, if I have V with one, two, three, four, that's IX. And then if I have just leftovers. So this is a more generic pattern uh, uh, and this is more specific one, right? Yeah, so there is a question what will give me eight. So to Roman eight. What should we expect? We should expect V one, two, three, right? That's the test case. So now we have kind of a edge cases for four, for nines, and for eight. So let's test this. Perfect, perfect score for all the tests. Yeah, so Elliot uh, asked what would eight do and eight do what we expect eight to do. Uh, the order in which you do the substitutions is important, right? That's why we kind of substituting fives with fives first. Oh, shit. And then uh, once we do that, we check if we have double Vs. If we do, we substitute it with X. If we have five X's, we substitute it with L. And then if we have V with four, we substitute it with nine. And if we have four, we substitute it with four like this, right? So the order in which we're doing the substitutions is, is important. And we see that it works for all the, all the edge cases and all the cases up to 50 or up to 100. We don't have C, right? Um, 
So if we wanted to have C, we would have to say if we have double 50, ah, then uh, we need to substitute it with one C and so on, right? Um, Okay, so we've learned quite a lot today. We've learned some basic syntax. We've learned some recursive, uh, you know, implementations for replacement, uh, like here. Uh, we've learned the comment testing because those are useful. I should probably add a couple more tests for the replacement, uh, although it works because it's been tested extensively with the two Roman and all the tests passed such that I don't really need a lot of tests, but it, it's good for uh, completeness that I kind of, um, so if I try to replace X with Y on an empty string, then I get an empty string, right? Um, and also I can do a little bit more elaborate tests um, for replacement, but other than that, it, it's work, it works fine. So what I'm, I will come, com, um, uh, commit the code into the repository such that you have the trace of today's lecture. And we will start our next lecture with um, uh, some other kind of simple katas. And we will think how this implementation would be done in, in Golang and how the particular <clears throat> language features make you think about the, the problem. Okay. So I kind of like the um the suggestion um here for the algorithm um uh the mentimeter stopped responding yeah so we have i click too many times no Yeah, anyway, we will kind of uh, continue this discussion with the uh, pseudocode and with the um, um, two Roman in, in Golang. And then we continue with some other uh, functional features of, of Haskell. So keep reading the book and I will see you guys on Thursday. Thanks.